trailer? And they said yes. And so the study actually paid to clean it up and paint it and put our logos on there. So you might be asking, how do you measure air pollution? Well, I've got some samples here that I'd like to pass around. Uh, some of them are air pollution samples from Grand Rapids. And some of them are air pollution samples from other places that I've been. The unlabeled ones are from Grand Rapids. And there's some labeled ones. There's one from Southern California, one from Mexico, and one from Detroit. And so these are what particle pollution samples look like. And how we collect them is we essentially have a vacuum pump, like a vacuum cleaner, and we have a filter holder, and this filter sits in there, and we just suck air over it. And we collect all the particles on the filter. You'll see that some of these have parts missing, because what we do is we take sections or punches, and we look and see what's on there. We can weigh it, find out how much partic particulate is in the air. We can also look at the different compounds that are there, and we'll talk in a second about how we use that information to figure out where that air pollution came from. This is what our uh, supplemental sites looked like with these little air quality monitors. We also had a meteorological station there as well so we could chart the wind speed and the wind direction at all these different sites. And so here is a graph of, in, at our central site, the 24-hour average concentrations of PM2.5. And this is a pretty boring graph. I'll admit it. It's not very interesting. It's not very exciting. And I like to go to places where there's lots of air pollution because I'm interested in studying air pollution. And this is pretty boring, right? You know, half the time air quality is good. The other half the time it's moderate. So, you know, it's the winter time. This isn't too exciting. But what my real interest in is using real-time measurements. So these are 24-hour averages. And 24-hour averages don't give us a lot of information. But if we can get greater temporal resolution, resolution in time, if we can get greater spatial resolution, then that tells us something. So if we fast forward to one hour concentrations, all of a sudden it gets a lot more interesting, right? We like it when we see lots of big spikes going on here. So when we look at one hour concentrations, we see that the daily average really doesn't paint the full picture. So the daily average is the regulatory standard. So we can't say anything about air quality from a regulatory perspective here in, uh, in Grand Rapids that's negative, right? It meets those 24-hour air quality standards. Everything is good. But people don't just walk outside for 24 hours. They're not exposed to air pollution 24 hours a day at their home, right? So hour by hour, we see that there are some periods in which air quality is not so good where we see very high concentrations of, of particulate matter, even some hours in which we reach that unhealthy range when everyone's going to be affected by this. Okay? So that was very interesting to us. And one of the problems with centralized air quality monitoring is that it doesn't tell you the whole story everywhere that you go. You're stuck in one place. And if nobody lives there, and at this site, it's actually at someone's home, but nobody lives within a thousand yards of their home. So this may be not real representative of what air quality is like everywhere at that, in that uh, municipality. So one of the things you might ask is, well, you've got this particulates. How do you know it comes from wood smoke? How do you know it comes from something else? Well, if we plot concentration versus the wind direction, we can see from what wind direction we get high concentrations of particulates. And so the way this graph works, the big red arrow is pointing at, this is the wind direction that produces that spike here, right here. So when the wind is sort of out of this easterly direction, we see the greatest concentration of particulates at this particular site. And this one's probably not the greatest graph in the world, because I couldn't overlay all the little graphs on this big one, so I just put some arrows there. But this is what we found. We found that when we plotted those wind direction plots, and we looked at what direction we had the highest concentration of wood smoke, it certainly looked like it was coming from these little red dots, which are our known sources of wood smoke. And in the wintertime, the prevailing winds are out of the northwest. And so we weren't seeing high concentrations out of the northwest. There is a, a mill here on the river, which a lot of people thought would affect the air quality. But it certainly looks anecdotally like, oh, the particulates are coming from these wood fire burners. So that was one piece of evidence that we had of the influence of wood smoke 
on these high particle concentrations. So these plots are kind of interesting as well. So we took our little monitor, we put it in a car, and we drove around. And so about every 10 seconds or so, that monitor takes a reading. And so we took those readings as we drove around. And this is a real cold night. And what the circles represent are concentrations of particles that our little monitor measured. And this circle right here is 35.5 micrograms. The bigger circles are higher concentration. The smaller ones are smaller concentration. That 35.5 is important because that's the 24-hour regulatory standard. Okay? Anything above that is higher than the regulatory standard. And so here's the early evening run. And you can see that concentrations in these areas here and here are starting to grow. And then we come back about two hours later, we make the same run, and now we've got really great big circles. So we have concentrations measured in this neighborhood of about 247 micrograms per cubic meter. So remember, the 24-hour regulatory standard is 35. We're showing about 247. Now, these are 10-second measurements because we're driving the car at about 25 miles an hour. But it is significant that if we look over here at this study site, and over here at this study site, the concentrations measured by the vehicle next to those study sites are pretty small compared to the concentrations only a half a mile away down the road. So what we're seeing is that maybe our central study sites don't do a great job of telling us what air quality is like everywhere out there. And if we go through these neighborhoods, we see that there are some places that are really being significantly impacted where we see some really high concentrations. Now that being said, this is an atmospheric issue because this is a cold night in which the air cannot escape from the ground level. We were out on nights where it wasn't so cold and it was really windy and we couldn't find any particle pollution. So this is a thing that comes and goes and comes and goes. But if you live in an area where there's a wood burner someplace, you already know this, right? You know on cold nights that you smell a lot of wood smoke, okay? But this gives us some idea of how high those concentrations can be in the wintertime close to sources of wood smoke. We're talking two, three, we even measured some concentrations in excess of 400 micrograms per cubic meter. Where does that go? Where does it go? Well, these fine particles, they can actually stay in the atmosphere for weeks. And so it hangs around until the wind kicks up. In the morning, the sun shines on the ground and the air warms up and that pollution starts to rise. And so one of the reasons yeah, it'll rise up and then the wind will blow it on. So we'll send that pollution on to somebody else. <laughs> yep. So here's that same evening and what I've done is given you a time series just like the other time series. So these are 10 second average concentrations as we move along. The vehicle's driving at somewhere between 15 and 20 miles an hour. So you can see that, you know, here we've got a half hour or so drive in which we get a lot of high particle concentrations along those neighborhoods. And these are mainly residential neighborhoods that we're driving through. And so we get some peaks that are sort of in the unhealthy and some that are in the very unhealthy. And I can tell you from being in the vehicle driving around, uh, Jared, who's one of my students here, can tell you as well that your eyes start to water, you start to have some difficulty breathing. So these are very high concentrations that we see out there. Uh, we're currently working uh, with Keith Rice's uh, research group. Now, Keith gave the first lecture this year. Maybe some of you were there. Um, so we're doing some GIS mapping of this mobile data that we have. So this is sort of a preliminary map, and what we hope to be able to show when we're all done is where these hot spots of wood smoke are. And so people in that community will be able to see, okay, this is the neighborhood that I live in. Oh, okay, maybe in that neighborhood we ought to talk about wood smoke with our neighbors because there certainly looks like there's some very high concentrations when we drive through that particular neighborhood. So that's one of the things that we're currently working on. So the last thing I want to talk about tonight is we have this anecdotal evidence, if you will, so circumstantial, right? If we're in a courtroom drama, we see that, okay, the wind direction is right coming from the wood boilers. That's where we see the wood smoke, but that's not proof enough, right? We need to know for sure whether that's wood smoke. And so in the 1990s, there was a research group at Caltech that came up with a forensic approach for studying air pollution. And I happen to be very fortunate in that one of the principal movers and shakers behind that 
experiment happens to be my graduate advisor at UW-Madison. So he is one of the people who really came up with this idea of this forensic approach. And the idea is that every pollution source emits a unique mixture of pollutants. There are some compounds that come from wood smoke that don't come from coal combustion. And if we can measure those compounds, then we have some way to trace the source of the pollution, and we actually have some way to model how much of the pollution comes from that source. So what you do is you take this great big thing, it's a big tube, and you pull it on up to a pollution source and you put a probe right in the tailpipe, you put a probe right in the smokestack, and you measure what comes out of it. And you come up with a ratio of the pollution that comes out of it to the concentration of specific molecules that only come from that particular source. And so what you get is a fingerprint. What does a wood burner look like? What does an automobile look like? What does a smoking vehicle look like? And so we come up with this source profile, this fingerprint of these individual sources. And we do this with organic compounds. And so we measure the total amount of organic compounds that come from the source. We measure the concentration of these fingerprint molecules called molecular markers that come from this. And then we can model um, actually, the EPA puts this model out. It's available to anybody if you have the know-how to use it. And you can model the contribution of individual sources to pollution measured at a certain location. So you take those samples that are out there, and you take a punch out, and you measure how much organic pollutant there is there, and you measure how much of that tracer compound is there. So the tracer for wood smoke is a compound known as levoglucosin. It's what you get when you burn cellulose. It turns into this sugar called levoglucosin. So we measure the amount of levoglucosin, and that tells us how much wood smoke is in the sample. And so here is what we got for our results. Now, this is a pretty expensive procedure to go through to, to do these samples, so we were only able to do certain samples. So we picked the days that had the highest pollution to look at and saw what the contribution of wood smoke is. So we were able to identify three primary sources of organic pollutants in our samples. Wood smoke, natural gas combustion, and mobile sources. So this would be a mixture of cars, it might be snowmobiles. We really couldn't distinguish with our model between those two. But they were relatively minor because you can see that most of the pollution here are these maroon bars, which is wood smoke. We also have these white bars, which are essentially things that we couldn't identify. So it's one of two things. It's either sources that we didn't know were out there, which is not too likely, or these are secondary pollutants that are actually created in the atmosphere. And so this model tends to give us an idea of what, how much those secondary pollutants uh, contribute to uh, air pollution on those days. And it can be pretty significant. So we measured the organics, we got our fingerprints, we found out how much wood smoke um, uh, contributed to our organics, and then we measured those other things we know to be out there. The nitrogen compounds, the ammonium nitrate, the ammonium sulfate, and so we came up with a pie here that said, in our particles, on average, during the study, what was the contribution of wood smoke? And what we see is on average, somewhere around 25% of all the particulate pollutants that we measured were due to wood smoke. And that number actually might be higher. We have these other inorganics here, and those include potassium, and potassium is actually a byproduct of wood burning as well. And we didn't get a chance to measure that, so it actually might be higher than 27%. But again, remember those nasty nitrogen oxides? So 41% of what we measured were due to these secondary pollutants, these ammonium nitrate particles and ammonium sulfate particles. Again, remember a lot of those nitrogen oxides are due just burning things in the presence of air produce those nitrogen oxide molecules. So what did we conclude? Well, we couldn't say that the community had poor air quality. Why? Because as far as the regulatory standards go, <laughs> I think that's our cue to wrap up. So we couldn't say anything from a regulatory perspective that, that air quality was bad because we had that really boring graph, right? No big peaks whatsoever. On a 24-hour average, everything looked just fine. However, we saw really significant short-term spikes in concentrations, and that is of some concern.
We had hours which air quality was absolutely poor at two of the three sites that we monitored at. And we saw that the meteorological data gave us some anecdotal evidence that it was caused by wood smoke. Um, we also saw that we had mobile monitoring that showed that in individual neighborhoods, air quality in the evening on cold nights could be up to the hazardous level. So lots of fine particulates in the air. Um, we did measure concentrations above 300 micrograms per cubic meter, even close to 400. Saw that about 27% of the particle pollution that we measured on average could be directly attributed to wood smoke, and that's using this forensic approach. So finding these molecular markers and using the fingerprints to figure out where things came from. Uh, so that is all I have for you this evening. I do want to take the time to acknowledge some help that we got along the way. The funding for our wood smoke project again came from the Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium. Our project partners who did a lot of work ahead of this study that helped us out, Wisconsin DNR, we had cooperation from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services which was very interested in the findings of our study, UW Cooperative Extension, the Wood County Health Department and the Wood County UW Extension also provided us with a lot of logistical support. And the town of Grand Rapids was very supportive and, and a wonderful town board really helped us out quite a bit. But most of the credit goes to the undergraduate researchers. So I did not work half as hard as they did. They were out there every day, all kinds of weather. They had to climb up on top of that trailer. They had to put on rubber gloves, which don't keep your hands warm handle all those filters with a great deal of care because fingerprints contain a lot of organics and you don't want to mess up your samples. And so they were there at all hours and all weathers doing the work and I really appreciate all of the hard work they did. They really are the unsung heroes here. I'm trying to sing their praise, I guess, at this point. So, and, and, uh, so thanks to them and thanks to you for being a great audience um, and I'm happy to take any questions you have at this point. Yes. If you're talking about ozone, like all that, why are we worried about holes in the ozone? So the ozone that's way up in the stratosphere actually protects us from ultraviolet radiation. So we don't have to breathe that air up there. And it, like I said before, the reaction that produces ozone is when an oxygen atom reacts with an oxygen molecule. So what happens in the stratosphere is the UV light comes down and it hits the ozone molecule and it breaks off an oxygen atom. And so that UV light is absorbed in that reaction. Then that oxygen atom then can recollide with an oxygen molecule and produce ozone again. So in the stratosphere, as long as there's not anything up there to disrupt things, the ozone stays up there, okay, and it protects us from the UV radiation. Ozone at the ground level, the tropospheric ozone, that's the bad stuff. That's the stuff that you don't want to be exposed to and you don't want to breathe. And so there's very little transport between the stuff way up high, which we